Hi kids! I'm Hello Kitty Bodhisattva, and today we're going to learn about the tantric activity of magnetizing. Those who practice the Vajrayana Dharma have the ability to magnetize all phenomena. The essence of the Dharma has two aspects, the vast approach of the causal vehicle of characteristics or sutra approach, and the profound approach of the resultant vehicle of secret mantra Vajrayana. That takes the fruition as the path. The special feature of secret mantra Vajrayana is to establish the body as a deity, to recite the mantra with a speech, and with mind to rest in samadhi. This is a short statement, yet its meaning is very vast. First, when we said that we meditate on the body as the deity, deity refers to all the deities of the four levels of Tantra, which are the deities that have appeared in this world and are infinite in number, as well as all the deities that have not appeared and haven't been mentioned in the Tantras. All the deities that we can meditate on are included in these two categories. Likewise, speech as mantra corresponds to the inexhaustible wheel of ornament of enlightened speech of all the Buddhas, which manifests naturally for the sake of sentient beings that can be tamed in the form of an incredibly vast array of different mantras. In terms of the practice for the mind, we said that mind needs to rest in samadhi. Since the number of thoughts that arise in the mind are beyond measure, samadhis to which are the antidotes to these countless thoughts are beyond measure. That is why we say that the Buddha in his great compassion is skilled and means. You also need to know that these different aspects of deities, mantras and samadhis haven't been created by the Buddha, nor thought out and produced by a conceptual mind. They are simply the qualities of the Buddha, the result of meditating on the deity, reciting the mantra with a speech, while mind rests in samadhi meditation, is the state of complete and perfect enlightenment. Once you have obtained the fruit of practice and you are a Buddha, you have the special quality of Buddhahood, which is to benefit sentient beings naturally through the spontaneous accomplishment of the four types of activities pacifying, enriching, magnetizing, and subjugating. Amongst these four types of activities, the first two, pacifying and enriching, can be applied in the context of the teachings of the causal vehicle of characteristics. However, sentient beings who cannot be reached by the teachings of the causal vehicle of characteristics because their destructive emotions are too strong they are affected by powerful desire. Or strong aversion for example need the magnetizing and subjugating activities which are a special feature of secret mantra Vajrayana, magnetizing activities are extremely powerful. Magnetizing deities when Samhogakiyas arise in the realms of the world by displaying movement without ever moving from the Dharmakiya, the manifestations that appear are in essence the Buddhas of the Five Families. Among these deities, the natural expression of the wisdom of discernment manifests is the deities of the Lotus Family of Magnetizing. The two aspects of skillful means and wisdom need to appear and manifest in deities. In the Lotus Family, the main deities are Amitabha, who is the manifestation of the skillful means aspect and Goyajina or Pandaravasini corresponding to the wisdom aspect. When the deities manifest, their features such as their mantras, midras, and samadhis also appear. The deity that we are practicing now is one of these deities who is the natural expression of the wisdom of discernment and the manifestation of the wisdom aspect. She is known as Kurukala. Now class, are you enjoying your lesson about magnetizing power? Let's watch a chariot dance from Nepal in the style of Kirikala. <laughs>
Although there is fundamentally no difference between the different deities, the manifestations of the wisdom of discernment are the deities of the Lotus family of magnetizing. The magnetizing deities have the power to bring circumstances under control. Magnetizing is to bring delusion under control. At the moment we are all sentient beings. We don't have freedom or power since we don't have control over our own situation and circumstances. This is because we are under the power of delusion. The root and source of delusion is I. When there is I, then there is others, and from self and others derive an infinite number of deluded perceptions and ideas. The thought of I is based on or imputed on our body, speech, and mind. The body appears as a physical form. Speech is the appearance of sounds that can be heard, but mind does not appear. Still, based on their constant interaction, it kind of appears. The method to bring this delusion under control is to liberate it. Once it is liberated, it is brought under control. In particular, the main target is the mind, because mind is the main actor. From among body, speech and mind, mind itself does not appear, yet this invisible agent keeps under its control the aspects that appear forms and sounds. So to accomplish this deity, you need to, as it is said, liberate all the sentient beings at the three cities. The three cities are the city related to physical appearances, the form realm. The city related to the speech aspect of all manifesting sounds, which is the desire realm and the city related to the invisible mind, the formless realm. These three cities thus cover the whole of the three realms of existence, in other words the entire universe, and they must be liberated. To liberate all sentient beings of the three cities, you need to manifest in a way that can accomplish this kind of activity, for example the deity Daikini Pamakandra Lotus Daikini. Pamakandra Lotus Daikini. Dakinis are classified according to their three spheres of activity Dakinis who move in the sky above, to Dakinis who move on the surface of the earth in between, and Dakinis who move under. The different Dakinis are beyond count there are hundreds of thousands of them. Dakinis are mainly embodiments of wisdom, although the aspect of skillful means is also present within them. It is when seeing wisdom that we realize the primordial wisdom of the state of complete liberation. That is why these deities are mainly physical manifestations of wisdom. Indeed, wisdom has many qualities such as the eyes of great wisdom, the appearance of great wisdom, etc. Basically, if you have great wisdom, the moment you think that all sentient beings in the three realms of existence are diluted, liberation takes place. This way of magnetizing is called bringing one's perceptions under control. You have power over all appearances that you perceive. The perceptions of others can also be overcome through the power of such realization. This is how it works. The teachings explain. Now class, we're going to talk about the practice of the Dini Pemakandro. So at the moment, the appearances in our perceptions are not under our control but under the control of something else. So we first need to bring our perceptions into our control. And since we do not have this power now, we practice deity, mantra medra, and samadhi to achieve it. You are seated in a simple meditation room, settled in a comfortable posture, back straight. Your half-opened eyes are aware of a single flickering candle. You're watching your own mind, as your Rinpoche has suggested, not analyzing, not studying, just watching. You are surprised, though, when your mind goes sometimes at the speed of light, one second here, one second there. You have flashes of your day at work, full of stress. You slap yourself down, then stop yourself. Your teacher had guided you not to control, just to watch. So you watch again and you watch. And this is why you are startled when your half-closed eyes glimpse a wondrous form, a dancing red form, a playful, stunningly beautiful female Buddha. She seems both wrathful and laughing at the same time. She spins and dances in a dervish of brilliant light, dazzling and hypnotic. She is dancing at the edge of emptiness, glowing with light, fantastical, beautiful, dazzling. And you know her because you've seen her in books. Your teacher has spoken of her briefly. She is Tara, the female aspect of the Buddha. But here, semi-wrathful, playing and exotic, all at the same time, her three eyes, yes, she has a third eye, open at her forehead, is focused on you. 
piercingly, yet you see her glowing light, her blessing light, pushing out in all directions, absorbing into all beings, going out into all worlds, dimensions, and times. She's not just here for you. You know this because her blessings are absorbing into everyone around the world, everyone in the entire universe, all beings. Her blessings are for everyone. Her name is Kula Kula. She is also Red Tara. She is equally all Taras. She is also all Buddhas all at once. She is also magic personified. She knows we all need a little magic in our lives, so she dances into our meditations in the form of a dancing magician. She does this because she knows life becomes too dry and numbing and the absence of joy in magic. This is, in part, her mission. She returns us to the euphoric joy of Buddha Dharma. For today, we can put aside our mindfulness practice and focus on the magic of her appearance. We can return to wonder. She sees that you are afraid of her, startled and shocked and disbelieving, and she laughs at you, flashing fangs and white teeth, but not ferocious more playful and charming. This aspect she has manifested is one of the diva star, beautiful like a movie star, alluring, impossible to look away from, and that is her magnetizing power. She is one of the beautiful people who uses her charm and charisma and stunning looks to draw you in. You don't resist because you know you are being drawn into the wisdom of compassionate activity. She applies her popularity and stunning looks to the Dharma cause, bodhicitta, metta, and compassion. She's all about love. She's also sparkling with magic. She is glowing with light, not flesh and blood. And she's blazing like a red sun. She holds a bow and arrow, drawn back like Cupid, but her bow is made of magical lotus flowers. Whatever she pierces with that lotus magic will feel the power of metta, of love, and compassion, karuna, for that is her mission. She is dancing so fast, flying in the air, a cyclone of magic and power. As a dakini, she dances on the edge of shunyata. Her power is to attract, magnetize, mesmerize. But her mission is an enlightened one. She draws us irresistibly to the Dharma. Yes, she is known as the love goddess in Vajrayana Buddhism. But this nickname and function is not other than a skillful means to draw us into the Dharma. Her flowery bow and arrow is aimed at bodhicitta and enlightenment. She is also known as the magic Buddha, the grantor of wishes. Yet this too is skillful means. By bringing us blessings and happiness, we have the circumstances conducive to Dharma practice without the stress, but don't mistake her wish granting for some unenlightened magician. There is a price to pay. You must stay on the path of bodhicitta, metta, and wisdom. Buddha Dharma. You can't take your eyes off her glowing red body, a brilliant light, red like the setting sun in the west. Her three eyes are semi-wrathful yet beautiful. Her hair stands straight up, energized by power. Two of her four hands draw a floral bow, the blessings of Metta and Karuna. In her other two hands she holds a Vajra hook, which you instinctively know is to hook you in, to draw you back into her compassionate arms, and a lasso, also made of red uptala flowers. And now you find yourself whispering her mantra over and over. Om Kuru Kule, Hum Three Swaha. 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 Hala Kababin, bring the pumpkin. Excellent. Watch this one. Welcome back, my students. Welcome back, students. 
Through the practice, the physical appearance of the body is blessed by the enlightened body, the speech is blessed by the enlightened speech, the mind is blessed by the enlightened mind. When we receive the blessings, it's like pouring milk into water the whole water becomes white. There is another example, but it may be a bit difficult for modern people to relate to alchemy. That transforms iron into gold. Great masters such as Nagarjuna and others were able to transform iron into gold instantly through alchemy. Still, they need the specific instructions to be able to do this. It is impossible without them, right? Likewise to let our present and pure mind manifest. As the natural expression of the wisdom of discernment, we need to apply deity, mantra, medra, and samadhi with the specific practice instructions. I've already explained at length about the benefits of practicing magnetizing activities. Do what you bring under your control humans who have a body during the day. Gods and spirits who have no physical appearance at night, thinking as it does. I have also spoken in detail about the visualization for bringing under control the outer environment, and all sentient beings within it. I taught extensively about the supports for that kind of practices, the special practical instructions, and the ritual aspect. I have shared the special whispered lineage instructions which are meant to be given to only one practitioner at a time, thinking of the benefit that this could bring to Buddhism in general, and to Sancho Rinpoche Siddhavara more specifically. So I have nothing else to add. No matter what you set out doing, you can't reap the fruit immediately. Meditation on the deity, mantra recitation, and samadhi visualization need to be practiced authentically. To expect some results from a few days of sketchy guesswork is being quite greedy. But if you join in the practice, you may think, I am doing something useful. Of course, this kind of grasping or thinking is always there. However, the instruction is that you should always start magnetizing practices by generating bodhicitta, having the initial motivation and pure intention of practicing for the sake of the teachings, the ones who hold them, and so on, in order to perform magnetizing activities. First, you need to practice and accomplish the deity again, the supreme accomplishment. Then the ordinary accomplishments will derive naturally from the realization of the supreme city. You can't expect to get the ordinary accomplishments from the start without having accomplished anything. For example, if you want to build a house, you first need to plan the work well. Therefore here, you must make sure to check am I doing this practice of Padma Kandra only because I want the supreme and ordinary accomplishments? Or am I doing this practice for myself? What I am saying is that you need to start the practice with the proper motivation. This is most important for us Buddhists. Whether we get a good result or not depends on motivation. You may have a good motivation and visualize the deity, recite the mantra, practice the samadhi of emanation and reabsorption, but if you examine whether you practice exactly as instructed, no one can practice 100% perfectly. Still, the teachings say that there's a little benefit in this kind of imitation of the genuine practice. In particular, it helps the mind to change slightly, which shows that deity, mantra, medra, and samadhi are true, that they have power, that they are undeceiving. Nuggets, 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 nuggets